Roaming majestically over the oceans of the world, the modern aircraft carrier is the largest warship ever to sail the seas. Displacing over 90,000 tons, more than 1,000 feet long and over 200 feet wide, with four acres of armored steel flight deck towering above the water. A nuclear-powered Nimitz-class carrier can transport 6,000 men on a voyage of one million nautical miles at top speeds exceeding 40 knots. The centerpiece of a mighty task force of escorting vessels, this floating city can be home, workplace, and battle station to its crews for months at a time, projecting overwhelming military force to the far corners of the Earth. But carrying practically no armament of their own, these enormous structures are virtually useless without the presence of the carrier's air wing. With nearly 90 aircraft acting as her striking force, however, the modern aircraft carrier is the most powerful and complex surface ship in nautical history. The image of this unique collaboration between ship and airplane has been so ingrained in the public's consciousness, it's hard to imagine that it did not always exist. But the voyage of the aircraft carrier to its preeminent role in naval strategy has been a triumph of technical ingenuity and individual courage. At the beginning of the 20th century, the battleship was the most dominant vessel in the world's navies. Fleets of imposing, heavily armored dreadnoughts became symbols of national power and influence. But with the advent of controlled flight, naval strategists came to recognize the utility of aircraft, if only as scouts for the battle fleet. The leaders of the U.S. Navy were among the first to experiment with putting aircraft on ships. And in 1910, they ordered a test that would make history. In Hampton Roads, Virginia, workers constructed a temporary wooden ramp over the foredeck of the scout cruiser USS Birmingham. On the afternoon of November 11th, pilot Eugene Ely accelerated down the ramp in his Curtis biplane and struggled into the air, landing at a shore base a few miles away. Seven months later in San Francisco Bay, Ely added to his previous achievement by landing a different Curtis plane on a platform built over the stern of the anchored armored cruiser Pennsylvania. As the Pennsylvania's captain greeted Ely, he told the intrepid flyer, this is the most important landing since the Dove flew back to the Ark. One hour later, Ely flew off the ship and returned to shore. Eugene Ely had triumphantly demonstrated the potential for naval aviation. Yet the leaders of the U.S. Navy failed to build on their early successes. Still convinced that the battleship would remain the dominant warship in the American fleet for years to come, they saw no pressing need to emphasize the development of U.S. naval aviation. The lack of enthusiasm on the part of the United States Navy for aviation at sea, if you will, came from what I call the battleship mentality. Our British brothers were a lot more innovative and a lot more receptive to new ideas than were the people in charge at that time. The British began using aircraft to scout for enemy ships just prior to World War I. They used planes equipped with pontoons called float planes that were carried on converted merchant ships. But to launch and recover their float planes, the ships had to stop and use onboard cranes to lift the aircraft to and from the water. This time-consuming process made it difficult for the vessels to keep up with the squadrons of warships they were scouting for. And since the float planes needed a smooth water surface for takeoffs and landings, it also made operations in rough weather nearly impossible. Weighed down by their pontoons, the float planes themselves were as unwieldy as the procedures needed to operate them. Responding to these shortcomings, in September 1918, the British commissioned the world's first practical aircraft carrier, the HMS Argus. What was special about the Argus, what was absolutely special, was that big flat deck the flat deck meant that an airplane could run up to take off. It meant an airplane could land. That meant that you didn't need float planes anymore. It was called an all-weather carrier. By later standards, it's a joke. It can only operate in fairly calm weather. However, 
compared to float planes, which were the, the earlier type of naval aircraft, it was a miracle. It was her flat deck that was the Argus's most recognizable feature, and which would give all succeeding carriers their distinctive appearance. It would also give them a distinctive nickname, flat tops. But the deck wasn't the only feature that the Argus passed on to her descendants. She also had electrically powered elevators that raised and lowered her aircraft from storage in the hangar deck to the flight deck above. Although World War I ended before the Argus became operational, in many ways she had set the pattern for the future. The close relations between the US and British navies and the free interchange of ideas relating to carriers led to renewed American interest in naval aviation. We have observers in Europe. We watch as they develop this thing. Also, we have British officers attached to the US Navy, and they tell us how they're going to do it. So by the end of World War I, the U.S. Navy is interested in aircraft carriers also and is talking about building one. In 1922, the U.S. Navy commissioned its first aircraft carrier, the experimental USS Langley. Converted from a naval coal carrier, she displaced 13,000 tons and had a top speed of 14 knots. A 534-foot wooden plank flight deck running virtually the length of the ship was mounted by a complex system of girders and trusses on top of the modified superstructure. But the most important advances made by the Langley had nothing to do with the design of the ship. They lay instead with the development of flight deck operating procedures. These included the introduction of the LSO, or Landing Signal Officer, who used flag signals to help guide the plane to a safe landing. A system called the arrestor gear was also devised. This consisted of a series of cables that were strung across the deck, designed to be snagged by hooks dangling from the landing aircraft. The arrestor gear helped bring planes to a stop before they plunged over the other end of the deck. In 1925, Captain Joseph T. Reeves took over command of the Langley. Even though he was a former battleship captain, the forward-thinking Reeves understood the potential of carrier-borne aircraft better than almost any other officer in the U.S. Navy. What was special about Langley wasn't anything designed into her. What was special about Langley was what Captain Reeves put on, and that was the idea of arresting gear and a barrier forward. The idea that you could operate a lot of airplanes if, instead of putting them in a hangar every time they landed, you move them to the front of the ship protected them with a barrier. In that way, Reeves managed to quadruple the number of planes on the ship. Captain Reeves also significantly increased the efficiency with which his aircraft were used by reducing the amount of time that was required between the launches of individual planes. What Reeves really did uh, as the skipper of the Langley was to fiddle around with the handling procedures of aircraft on his aircraft carrier to the extent where he was able to reduce launch intervals substantially and therefore get large numbers of airplanes in the air in a short time. One major drawback to the Langley's flight operations was her slow speed. In order to leave the ground, a plane needs enough wind under its wings to lift into the air. On land, this is simply a matter of accelerating until the proper speed is reached. But on a carrier, the distance that a plane can travel to achieve its takeoff speed is restricted by the relatively short length of the flight deck. When a carrier turns toward the wind to launch its aircraft, the faster it goes, the more wind passes over the deck to help lift its planes into the air. But with a top speed of only 14 knots, the Langley was unable to generate much wind over her deck, which in turn limited the size and striking power of the plane she could operate. Since a carrier mounted little armament of its own, this was a crucial shortcoming. Despite this and other problems, on the Langley, a generation of naval aviators learned the skills and discipline that would sustain carrier operations through future challenges. But the aircraft carrier's voyage to supremacy had just begun. In the years following the First World War, naval commanders viewed the aircraft carrier as primarily a launch platform for scout planes to support the battleship, which was still the fleet's main offensive weapon. Ironically, 
It was an arms control agreement that gave the carrier its biggest boost in breaking out of his secondary position. The Washington Naval Disarmament Treaty of 1922 severely curtailed the construction of new battleships and their swifter cousins, battle cruisers. But since most naval strategists considered aircraft carriers to be little more than auxiliary vessels, they were far less restricted. With the only other alternative being to scrap their partially constructed battleship and battlecruiser hulls, the world's great naval powers began converting them into aircraft carriers instead. In the United States, what would have been the battlecruisers Lexington and Saratoga emerged as aircraft carriers in 1927. The 880-foot-long flight decks that topped their armored hulls were the world's longest and would remain so for the next 18 years. Their 16 boilers generated 180,000 horsepower, giving them an amazing top speed of 33 knots. A 33,000-ton vessel uh, that could go 30 knots or more uh, was very impressive, not only in what it could do to avoid enemy submarine threat, for example, but, but even more so, it gave it a flexibility in generating wind over the deck to operate airplanes with, uh, with a lot higher weight and performance. But the most impressive thing about the Lexington and Saratoga was their formidable offensive capability. With each ship carrying an air group of just over 80 fighters and bombers, they could send a significant striking force well over the horizon, far beyond the reach of even the mightiest battleship guns. In January 1929, during a mock attack on the strategic Panama Canal, the Saratoga proved this capability by performing what would become a milestone in aircraft carrier tactics. In command was now Admiral Joseph Reeves, who was anxious to put his Langley experience to the test. Reeves separated Saratoga from the rest of the battle fleet and maneuvered her away from the target area. The defending force searched in vain for the missing carrier. Two days later, Saratoga changed course, making full speed towards the canal. Reeves again defied convention by ordering his 83 planes to be launched in the pre-dawn darkness, 200 miles out at sea. Arriving over their targets at daybreak, the strike force achieved complete surprise. Had it been a real attack, the strategically vital canal would have been crippled before its defenders could mount an effective defense. Admiral Reeves' innovative maneuver demonstrated the true potential of the aircraft carrier as an independent striking force. By 1936, when the limitations imposed by the Washington Naval Treaty expired, there were four aircraft carriers in the U.S. Navy. As war threatened in Europe and the Far East, Congress authorized funds for additional carriers. A new fast carrier, the USS Hornet, was rushed into production in 1939. She joined the fleet in October 1941. Just a few months later, the Hornet would be instrumental in delivering the first blow against an enemy who had learned all too well the lessons of the previous decade. Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, December 7th, 1941. Executing a plan conceived by Japanese Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, a task force of six Japanese carriers launched a strike of over 200 planes that succeeded in crippling or sinking eight American battleships. It was the most devastating use of aircraft carriers to that time. But the three American aircraft carriers that Yamamoto had hoped would be in port were on maneuvers at the time of the attack and escaped destruction. With virtually all of their battleships out of commission, the leaders of the U.S. Pacific Fleet began to develop an offensive strategy around the only major warships they had left afloat, their carriers. Pearl Harbor changes things because it eliminates the battleships so that the fleet can't operate the way it used to. That's a big change. But contrary to popular belief, the U.S. Navy wasn't caught completely unprepared for the shift to a carrier-based war effort. The attack only accelerated a process that had already begun. The airplanes that are going to win the Pacific War are largely already in development. The radars that we're going to use are in development, but we don't really understand how to use them yet, and we don't understand that for several more years. While U.S. naval planners were still developing the new offensive carrier strategy, 
they turned to their aircraft carriers to perform a unique and dangerous mission. In early 1942, with the Allies reeling from the seemingly unstoppable Japanese advance across the Pacific, the U.S. Navy proposed a bold propaganda stroke, an air raid against the Japanese homeland. Their primary target, the capital city of Tokyo. The so-called first special aviation project assigned Army B-25 medium bomber aircraft to a mission that the plane's designers had never dreamed of to be launched from an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean. The B-25 had been chosen because of its relatively long range, but the size and weight of the normally land-based planes meant it would be extremely difficult for them to take off from even the largest carrier. Because of these difficulties, it would take an officer of extraordinary ability to lead the daring mission. That man was aviation pioneer and speed champion, Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle. On April 18, 1942, enemy patrol boats spotted a task force, including the Hornet and the Carrier Enterprise, 700 miles from the Japanese mainland. Even though they were 300 miles away from the planned launch point, Task Force Commander Vice Admiral William Bull Halsey made the decision to arm and launch the B-25s. Skimming the waves to avoid detection, Doolittle and his men managed to reach their assigned targets. Though the raid was not intended to cause major physical damage, it provided a much needed boost to American morale and an equally stunning shock to the Japanese. I think we probably did more to harm the morale of the Japanese people uh, than we did to boost the morale of the Americans, although they were both important propaganda efforts. When President Roosevelt was asked the source of the raid, he smiled and said that it had come from Shangri-La. The name of a famous James Hilton novel, Shangri-La was a mythical place in Tibet. Though the Americans tried to obscure the source of the raid, the Japanese high command quickly realized that it must have come from the decks of an aircraft carrier. As a direct result, Admiral Yamamoto accelerated preparations for a final showdown with the U.S. carriers. The Japanese determined that they must wipe out the U.S. fleet. It forces them to overextend. And in that sense, it's a brilliant ploy. I don't think that was the objective to start with. I don't think we understood the Japanese well enough to be able to predict this. But it worked brilliantly. Yamamoto's plan centered on the invasion of a tiny island in the Central Pacific. It was called Midway. And it would be the scene of one of the most ferocious and decisive battles ever fought between aircraft carriers. Before Admiral Yamamoto could implement his ambitious plan to annihilate the U.S. carriers at Midway, the Japanese had to secure the southern portion of their conquests. They planned to do this by establishing a defensive perimeter of military bases in the South Pacific, stretching through the Marshall Islands and New Guinea. May 1942. In an effort to blunt the Japanese advance, the U.S. carriers Lexington and Yorktown steamed into the Coral Sea to thwart a Japanese invasion force of 70 ships, including three carriers, which was directed at Port Moresby. Planes from Yorktown and Lexington sank one Japanese light carrier and damaged a larger one. But Lexington herself was mortally wounded and had to be abandoned. She was the first U.S. carrier to be sunk in the war. The Yorktown sustained only moderate damage. Coral Sea was the first time that the opposing ships in a naval battle never came within sight of each other. All the damage was inflicted by carrier aircraft. The striking range is determined by the airplanes. Now, I should say that all through the 1930s, one of the things that the U.S. carrier force constantly practices is finding the other carrier first at very long range. Tactically, the battle was a draw. The Americans lost more ships, but the Japanese lost more airplanes and valuable pilots, and their attack on Port Moresby failed. For the first time since Pearl Harbor, the Japanese advance had been stopped. 
Yet Admiral Yamamoto was anything but deterred. He was now more convinced than ever that he must capture Midway and sink the remaining U.S. carriers. The force he assembled for the much-anticipated Midway operation comprised a fleet of 160 warships, including four large carriers. Acting on information from decoded Japanese radio traffic, and despite objections from some of his staff, Admiral Chester Nimitz committed his only three carriers, Enterprise, Hornet, and Yorktown, to the coming battle. At Midway, the Japanese have two objectives. One is to seize the island itself. They think of that as a stepping stone towards Hawaii. The more important objective for them is to get our fleet out and destroy the remaining U.S. carriers. Our objective is destroy the Japanese fleet. And we have the advantage that we know they're coming and we know where they're, where they're coming towards. On June 4th, 1942, Yamamoto initiated the fighting with a bombing attack on Midway Island. When the battle was over four days later, four of his carriers had been sent to the bottom. Only one American carrier was lost, the USS Yorktown. As at Coral Sea, the major warships did not exchange a shot. Midway proved once and for all that the carrier was superior to the battleship as an independent offensive weapon. From then on, it was the battleship that became the escort vessel for the aircraft carrier. With the aircraft carrier now the centerpiece of U.S. naval strategy in the Pacific, a new generation of American carriers began entering combat in 1943, the Essex class. Demonstrating the enormous technical and industrial capacity of the United States, the Essex went from the drawing board to active duty in the astonishingly brief period of under three years. The U.S. performed a minor miracle. They actually created uh, a carrier force in a, in a time frame that was, is mind-boggling today. Uh, Fourteen of the aircraft carriers in the Essex class actually saw combat in World War II. We went from, from practically nothing to a really impressive force. The main goal designers had in planning the Essex was to provide space in her hangars for more aircraft than could be carried by her predecessors, up to 100, as opposed to the Hornet's 81. The rapid growth of aircraft size and weight since the beginning of the war also meant that a longer flight deck and greater swiftness would be needed. The result was a ship displacing 35,000 tons with an 860-foot long flight deck and enormous speed. It was fast. It could go in excess of 32 knots, and it had relatively commodious uh, hangar bays so they could take aircraft down below in bad weather rearm them, fix them, rework them, and then they had enough elevators to operate them so that they could get them back up to the flight deck, back up rearmed. The combined effect of that design gave you a very, very potent uh, fighting weapon. Together with new aircraft like the Grumman F6F Hellcat fighter and the TBF Avenger torpedo bomber, the USS Essex and her more than one dozen sister ships formed the core of a team which proved unbeatable for the duration of the war. The inherent strength and durability of the Essex class was dramatically displayed in March of 1945 during the violent and bloody campaign for Okinawa. A lone Japanese dive bomber scored two direct hits on the USS Franklin. The bombs penetrated Franklin's flight deck detonating amidst fueled and armed planes in the hangar deck. In the ensuing explosions and fires that swept through the ship, 724 men were killed and 265 wounded. But through superhuman effort, the Franklin's crew brought the fires under control. It's one of those things you read about and you find yourself shaking your head. But the thing that, that amazed uh, all of us most was the fact that she managed to take herself all the way back to the United States, 12,000 miles over the open ocean, and, and get back into the yard to get fixed. And that's, that's a story in itself. The U.S. Naval Bureau of Ships called it the most severe fire survived by any U.S. warship during the course of World War II. 
It was the closest any Essex-class carrier came to being lost to enemy action. The atomic weapons that brought an end to the world's bloodiest conflict would have a profound influence on carrier development and determine the fate of at least one veteran warrior. In July 1946, the USS Saratoga, witnessed to 20 years of struggle and achievement, was once again called into the Central Pacific as part of a test at a small coral atoll named Bikini. It would be her last call to duty. The atomic blast that sent the Saratoga to the bottom would be an ominous portent of future difficulties in the development of the aircraft carrier. The awesome power of atomic weapons caused a major rivalry to develop between the newly independent U.S. Air Force and the Navy as to who should have the primary role in defending the United States. Some leaders in the Air Force believed that there was no longer any need for the Navy and its carriers, arguing that the Air Force's nuclear-armed bombers could fulfill all of America's strategic defensive needs. But while the debate raged within the halls of the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill, political events unfolding on the other side of the globe determined the immediate future of the aircraft carrier. In June 1950, the North Koreans invaded South Korea. Within a week, the carrier USS Valley Forge was heading at full speed toward the Korean Peninsula. For the next 29 months, Navy carriers provided close air support for UN ground forces. And attacked communist supplies coming overland from the north. The most important development in the carrier's arsenal during this period was the introduction of jet aircraft. Faster and harder hitting, jets like the Grumman Panther gave the carrier significantly more striking power. The shorter time jets could spend in the air because of their greater fuel consumption, coupled with their higher landing speeds, had a significant impact on how the carriers operated. What we discover in Korea is that with jet aircraft, carrier operations change quite a bit. Uh, jet aircraft don't stay up as long as propeller-driven planes, so the carrier has to run at a much higher tempo. Also, they land a lot faster. It turns out to be quite a bit more dangerous. So what we learned first in Korea is how difficult it is to operate jets from carriers, but we can operate them. But that begins to tell us that the carrier has to change to accommodate the new type of aircraft. For answers to the challenges posed by jet operations, American naval aviators once again looked across the sea, where in the early 1950s, the British had developed three innovations that greatly facilitated the transition from propeller to jet aircraft. The angled deck, the optical landing system, and the steam catapult. By angling the flight deck only a few degrees relative to the ship's center line, the forward part of the flight deck could be used for parking and launching aircraft while the angle portion of the deck was used for landings and other launches if necessary. Angling also significantly increased the area of the deck, which made it easier for carriers to operate the larger and heavier jet aircraft. It enhanced safety for the pilots as well. If you made a landing that wasn't perfect and you weren't able to, to arrest, uh, you didn't run into a barricade and damage the airplane. You just bounced back into the air, added full power, and went around and tried again. The increased landing speeds of jet aircraft made it more difficult for pilots to see the flags the landing signal officer used to indicate any adjustments needed during the plane's final approach to the carrier. To compensate for this problem, the British developed the mirrored landing site which allowed the pilot to optically align his approach to the carrier by following a beam of light reflected from the ship along his proper angle of descent, called the glide slope. So that, that allowed you to, to replicate landings with a fair degree of accuracy and also to place yourself on the flight deck, touch down, in other words, 
as they say in the trade, in the spaghetti among the wires. The carrier-borne steam catapult, allowing for high-speed launches of even the heaviest of aircraft, was also a British development. It was a significant improvement over a planned American catapult that would have used exploding gunpowder to hurl the plane into the air. Again, we're very lucky. The British invented a way out of this, and the way out was a steam catapult. You have a piston, you use steam from the ship's boilers, and it just pushes the plane out. Those key things in carriers have to be credited to the British. The angle deck, the mirror sight, and the steam catapult made it possible to do modern carriers. The first American carrier to incorporate all of the new British developments was the USS Forrestal, launched in 1954. But though she was new, her design was based on a ship whose plan emerged during the Air Force-Navy debate over the issue of atomic weapons deployment. In the years following World War II, early atomic bombs were heavy and bulky, requiring a large aircraft with sufficient fuel to reach the distant Soviet landmass. The gigantic B-36 bomber provided this capability to the Air Force. What the Navy proposed as an alternative was a new class of huge carriers equipped with nuclear-armed jet bombers, displacing 67,000 tons with a flight deck over 1,000 feet long. The design and dimensions of the lead ship in the new class, the USS United States, were determined by the size of the aircraft needed to carry the ponderous nuclear weapons. The uh, United States was a big carrier design aimed to do nuclear warfare. She was going to be a, an atomic warfare base at sea. Competing to hold on to their share of the diminishing post-war defense budget, the Air Force and Army raised strenuous objections to developing the new class of carrier, whose estimated cost of $150 million per ship made them nearly five times as expensive as World War II's Hornet. Nevertheless, Congress approved construction of the United States in 1949. Then, only nine days after her keel had been laid down, Secretary of Defense Lewis Johnson, a strong and vocal advocate of land-based bombers, canceled the program. The USS United States was really the most famous ship that was never built. The decision to cancel the construction of the United States, I think, was a terrible blow to the United States Navy, but still, the design had an effect on future carriers. The outbreak of war in Korea cut short any lingering debates about future roles for the aircraft carrier. The result was the Forrestal. After the Korean War started, it became obvious that large carriers were well worth the effort, and a large carrier program was revived. The Forrestal design owed a great deal to the, the United States. At 60,000 tons, the Forrestal was scaled down in displacement from the United States. But her price tag was not. In fact, at nearly $190 million, inflation actually swelled her cost beyond that of the United States. The Forrestal also retained the 1,000-foot flight deck and other features designed for her predecessor to facilitate the operation of nuclear-armed aircraft. A single ship could now launch enough destructive force to decimate an entire country. The supercarrier had been born. Yet though her major intended role was nuclear deterrence, the Forrestal's cavernous hangar deck and large complement of aircraft would prove equally valuable in waging conventional warfare. But it was the power of the atom that would determine the next crucial step in the evolution of the aircraft carrier. Although he never commanded a ship in battle, Hyman Rickover was one of the most unusual and influential commanders ever to wear the stars of an admiral in the U.S. Navy. By relentlessly building on the scientific breakthroughs of the World War II atomic bomb project, Rickover almost single-handedly made nuclear propulsion on U.S. ships a reality. A lot of his thinking was innovative and different and unconventional, so he generated a lot of enemies within the Navy and within the establishment. So in order to do what he knew he had to do, he had to generate support within the Congress, which he did to great effect. Producing its energy from tiny enriched uranium pellets, nuclear reactors hardly ever required refueling. 
a warship that was powered by one would be freed from the need to carry bulky conventional fuel and would be able to travel almost unlimited distances. During the early 1950s, Rickover focused almost exclusively on developing a viable nuclear propulsion system for submarines. But after he accomplished this goal with the USS Nautilus in 1955, Rickover turned his attention to surface ships. Many people think of Rickover primarily as a submarine man. But if you look at what he did, he was much more a nuclear power man than a submarine man. And he thought of the mobility the Navy could get out of nuclear power more than anything else. Funds for a reactor-powered carrier, based on what was essentially a Forrestal design, were authorized by Congress in 1958. Two years later, the USS Enterprise was launched. The eight reactors that powered her actually took up more space in the ship than the conventional engines of the Forrestal. Partly for this reason, the Enterprise displaced 76,000 tons, 16,000 more than the Forrestal and was 50 feet longer than the first supercarrier. At a cost of over $450 million, she was also more than twice as expensive as her conventionally powered cousin. But the Enterprise's nuclear power gave her many advantages in addition to increased range. Incredibly, she could reach speeds that were faster than a World War II PT boat. Probably one of the most impressive things about Enterprise, and I watched this myself from another carrier, was its enormous performance. It could accelerate much faster than a fossil fuel carrier, and it could go much faster uh, at the upper end. Uh, I, th I think its speed is probably still classified, but over 40 knots is no big deal. You could water ski barefoot behind it. In 1963, the Navy conceived Operation Sea Orbit. Officially, a public relations goodwill cruise to demonstrate the mobility of their trio of nuclear-powered surface ships. It was also an attempt to mute growing criticism in Congress over the nuclear program's escalating costs. Task Force One, consisting of Enterprise, the cruiser Long Beach, and the frigate Bainbridge, circled the globe without having to refuel. Those three ships were able to steam at very high speeds without refueling from anyone and go great ranges and do absolutely marvelous things. And it was a publicity stunt. It was intended to show exactly what flexibility nuclear power gave to the U.S. Navy at a time when the Navy needed support. Because although in the long term it wasn't that expensive, the initial investment of reactors on a surface ship or a submarine or an aircraft carrier was enormous. Beginning in 1965, during the Enterprise's several tours of duty in the Tonkin Gulf off Vietnam, the capacity of nuclear propulsion for sustained operations was more convincingly displayed. Conventionally powered U.S. carriers also saw plenty of action in Southeast Asia, where they performed what has become a recurring role. With no enemy navy to oppose them, they became floating air bases for massed airstrikes deep into enemy territory. Control from a compartment deep inside the ship called the Combat Information Center, where data from all the carrier's sophisticated electronic sensors were monitored. These airstrikes could be coordinated with clockwork precision. But despite the lack of an enemy navy, for the thousands of personnel crowded among tons of aircraft, gasoline, and high explosives, there were other potential dangers to contend with. On July 29, 1967, aboard the USS Forrestal, an accidental surge of voltage ignited a rocket mounted underneath the wing of one of the strike aircraft. This started a fire which engulfed surrounding aircraft, starting a chain reaction of missile and bomb detonations that blew seven holes in the armored flight deck. Searing flames ate through six of the 10 decks below. Crewmen risked their lives to pull weapons and bombs off the loaded and sometimes still burning planes and jettison them over the side. Fires burned for 13 hours, destroying 21 aircraft and killing 134 crewmen. But like the USS Franklin before her, the Forrestal had withstood the functional equivalent of multiple enemy hits and still survived. <laughs> 
The important thing about the fire was what we learned in the design of future aircraft carriers, and that had to do with the need for the Navy to do developmental work on munitions that were less sensitive to heat and developmental work on fire extinguishing systems that had greater volume of seawater at higher velocity so you could literally wash these things over the side of a flight deck. The successful performance of sea-based strike planes during the Vietnam War validated the role of the large deck supercarrier. Yet controversy surrounding the use of nuclear power continued. The USS Enterprise was a magnificent prototype, but at the time she was considered too expensive to be built in large numbers. The next generation nuclear carrier would not emerge until 20 years after the launch of the Enterprise, during an era in which the $450 million price tag of the earlier supercarrier looked like a bargain. She was called the USS Nimitz. Although reactor-driven, the eight Nimitz-class carriers are far removed from their nuclear predecessor, the Enterprise. Two large and efficient power plants of modern design have taken the place of eight smaller ones. At over 90,000 tons, they're nearly three times heavier than a World War II Essex-class ship, and fully seven times that of the Langley. The electronics and communications improvements over earlier carriers make a Nimitz-class combat information center the most advanced ever. At a cost of over $2 billion each, these gigantic vessels are also the world's most expensive surface ships. In the Nimitz class, we combine very long endurance, nuclear power, somewhat larger size, a lot of ordnance, a lot of capacity for aircraft. Nuclear power has one other advantage that I don't think people realize. When you go to sea, you're in a steam-powered ship, there's a lot of pollution. Well, it also ruins everything on deck. So that means that all those aircraft on deck begin to fall apart. A lot more effort is required to maintain them. Radar antennas begin to go bad. There are a lot of things that don't sound very important, but when you add them up, they count a great deal. With the ability to perform a wide variety of missions, a Nimitz-class carrier possesses a more powerful air force than most nations. These impressive capabilities ensure that the Nimitz and her seven sister ships will continue to dominate the seas well into the 21st century. In an era of robotics and microchips, the carrier is in some ways a curious anachronism. A medieval city, a fortress from whose walls archers launch flaming arrows into the darkening sky. But unlike the battleship, in whose shadow it developed and which it eventually eclipsed, the uniquely adaptable aircraft carrier redefines its role with every deployment. Carriers are special because they last a very long time and they change so much. They're special because the way in which they and their airplanes fit together is very unusual. They're special because of the variety of missions they fulfill. They're the most flexible thing you ever see in naval warfare, and they're amazing. In an uncertain world, the singular presence of the aircraft carrier has established it as an instrument of thundering power and silent persuasion. Thank you.